We've been investigating where the various different Vote Leave groups got their cash from for the last maybe year and a half. In a sense, we don't know the answer. There's lots of these different threads you follow, whether it's the money the DUP got from somewhere that was about kind of nearly half a million pounds, or there's the question about Aaron Banks and where Aaron Banks really got all his money from. We showed that, you know, he probably isn't as rich as a lot of the claims about him make out. And so, you know, if it's not his money, then, then where did it come from? Um, and you could follow you know, where Vote Leave got some of its public money from as well, you know, money it has declared. And in a sense, we don't know all the answers to those questions, but in another sense, we do, in that what's consistently true as we keep looking into this is that huge amounts of this money has come through various kind of cracks in the British Constitution. So most of those are crime protectorates like the Isle of Man, which Aaron Banks is a key player in, or Gibraltar, which is the British Overseas Territory, which again, Aaron Banks is a very lot of involvement in, and, and various you know, other donors and groups have used these various different gaps in the British Constitution, of course, Northern Ireland is another example of that in a sense, to channel money into British politics. And for me, what that shows is that, you know, Britain, which is a kind of weird country, we're one of only four countries in the world without a written constitution, which means that the rulers of the country can basically make things up as they go along. And they can use this kind of network of tax havens we have, you know, we have the world's biggest and most important network of tax havens to launder their money through the country. And they were very keen, people were experts in doing this, were very keen to make sure that Brexit happened so they could continue to launder their money so the EU wouldn't regulate those spaces. And, you know, they were worried about the EU regulating it, so they pushed Britain further offshore, they funded a lot of this campaign. It seems to me quite clearly that for those people, that's what Brexit was about. I think it's really important to understand what we talk about when we talk about Russia in the modern world. And this isn't 1975. We're not in the middle of the Cold War. This isn't the Soviet Union. This is Russia today, which came through this process in the 90s of what you might call disaster capitalism, where the Soviet Union collapsed and the kind of whole Russian state was asset stripped. And a lot of people made themselves into billionaires overnight. And they discovered that through disaster, you can find huge opportunity if you're already quite rich and powerful. And a lot of those people are still kicking around and they are firstly, you know, very keen to continue to use Britain as their money laundry. Often what they would do once they got the cash is launder it through British overseas territories, through the city of London and so on. And also they are, you know, very keen on crisis. They, they've learned, you know, the, the best way possible that you can make millions and sometimes billions by promoting crisis. And so you know, there's a huge interest uh, that's often associated with Russia in promoting Brexit, both as a crisis and to protect the world's money laundry. And so it seems to me that when we're talking about Russia, we're not talking about, you know, the kind of old reds under the bed Soviet Union of the past. What we're talking about is this kind of nexus of power around a kind of vortex of disaster capitalism. And that some of those people, of course, support Putin, are in bed with Putin. Putin is sometimes thought to be the richest man in the world because of this process of disaster capitalism. Some of those people oppose Putin. You know, some of the people who have been very involved, you know, the funders of the Legatum Institute, for example, are tied to Russia, but they're not on the Putin side of that split at all. So the thing they all have in common is not that they support Putin. It's much more that they are tied into a kind of disaster capitalist history. I suppose the other thing that's important about Russia is it's seen by many white nationalists as a kind of utopia. It's kind of this like white nationalist paragon of virtue because it's very white and it's got this tough, strong man leader. And so a lot of kind of Western fascists are very keen of it. So you've got this kind of weird relationship between disaster capitalism and kind of, you know, billionaires who like asset stripping companies and laundering their money, and then kind of white fascists in both Britain and America who are very keen on promoting the idea of strong man leaders and white countries. Roberto Savioni is the kind of um, world's expert on the Mafia. He's a, this journalist who lives in Naples and has to have armed guards all the time so the Mafia don't kill him. And a couple of years ago, he was kind of famously asked what the most corrupt country in the world is. And he said, well, Britain, because Britain is where, you know, all of the world's criminals and crooks launder their money. Britain has the world's most important connection, uh, collection of overseas territories, of, of you know, um, of tax havens and secrecy areas 
in our overseas territories and our crown protectorates. You know, I always say to people that the majority of wealth the British government is ultimately responsible for isn't in this archipelago. It's in our overseas territories. The majority of land that the British government is responsible for is not in this archipelago. It's in the overseas territories. In fact, most of the land the British state is responsible is in the southern hemisphere. Um, the majority, 90% of biodiversity the British government is responsible for is not in this archipelago. It's in the overseas territories. And I think we kind of forget as British people that we don't live in a normal country. We live in a state that was set up to run an empire and which has been, you know, was designed in order to basically take wealth from around the world and suck it into the centre for the British ruling class. And what we've done is transform that land empire into this kind of financial empire with London at its centre and overseas territories around the world, which is the kind of most important network in the world for laundering. So, for example, when the Panama Papers came out, which people might remember were kind of revealed a whole lot of stuff about tax dodging, a lot of the headlines at the time were about sort of politicians in the global south who'd been corrupt and stolen all this money and so on. What less of the stories said was that the majority of companies listed in the Panama Papers were listed either in Britain or its overseas territories. So the, com the country that's benefiting most from this is Britain, the country which, you know, whose ruling class is doing the kind of laundering of the money is Britain. And I, can't, I think you can't understand Brexit without getting your head around the fact that one of the most important things Britain does in the world is launder money for everything. Britain is now also the world's hub for mercenary companies. It's the kind of biggest centre for the privatised military in the world. So since the Iraq war, more and more of the kind of military uh, contracts in the world have gone rather than like, you know, to the army as it used to, or the Air Force or the Navy, it's gone to a private company. And I always think that, particularly with the Cambridge Analytica story, we often misunderstand what that's really about. Because Cambridge Analytica is a small branch of a much bigger company called SCL. And SCL, if you go onto its website, the first line of its website is that this is a defence contractor. This is a company that was set up uh, basically to take the kind of PSYOPs bit of military operation and take and privatise that. So they get the contracts now to do PSYOPs work around the world, which used to be done by the army. You know, the army got you know, good at propaganda over you know, the last 40, well it's always done propaganda, but particularly over the last 40 years. And then that was privatised to companies like SCL, and then they realised they could use the techniques they'd learnt in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, and use them to win elections and referendums in places like the USA and the UK. And that's totally terrifying, the kind of militarisation of our domestic politics. Of course it was terrible in the Global South, and it's you know, now been kind of turned back on the West, and this sort of use of the colonial power of modern privatised propaganda back in the old colonising powers is a huge shift that shapes our politics in very different ways. So I think we need to understand that Britain is not a normal country. It's not a normal democracy and we need a process of sort of renewal where, you know, through, I think, probably a constitutional convention, we write the rules of British democracy or perhaps English democracy if Scotland and Northern Ireland and Wales want to make their own way um, and become a kind of normal modern country rather than this sort of weird empire state. The, uh, the Scottish journalist Neil Ashton once said that you can no more get democratic socialism from the British state than milk from a vulture. And I think that's about right, you know, that we live in this kind of decaying empire. And what we need to do is have a process where we come together we agree the new rules for a modern democracy that we want to be, that would probably not allow British overseas territories to be centres for money laundering, probably would have a sensible voting system, probably would devolve some of the power from Westminster. We have the most centralised state in the Western world, for example. And I think that you know, there's lots of ways that we can achieve that, but too often campaigns on constitutional questions are atomised into individual issues, whether that's the House of Lords or demanding proportional representation or whatever it is. And what we really, really need to do is renew our democracy and you know, come up with a new system. And hopefully in doing so, like we've seen in Ireland, where they had a constitutional convention, which led to the two referendums, both on very important issues in their own rights, on both abortion rights, as more recently, and the equal marriage referendum but also in doing that they renewed the whole country they reinvented themselves in the world and said we're not this sort of catholic backwater of europe we're a modern progressive 
nation now. And I think that England particularly, you know, Scotland's been through a very positive referendum process in the last few years, but England needs a process where it can unleash the sort of more positive energy and redefine itself and find a new way to talk about itself in the modern world.